Hello, everyone. So um, I'm Stefan Greber, work at Canonical. I'm running the Lexi, Lexi, LexiFS project. I've uh, been doing container stuff for well over a decade, I think, at this point. And you may notice there's a slight issue with uh, people here. Like I'm supposed to have Christian with me, who is, well, not here. Um, he's been around all week, uh, but um, because of the Aer Lingus rebooking fun stuff that happened over the weekend, he ended up being rebooked on a flight that's living right around now. So instead of presenting with me, he's actually at the airport. Uh, so I'm going to be covering kind of content for both of us. Hopefully, um, I can answer any questions you might have on the stuff you would normally have been covering. All right. So uh, I'm just going to start with the basics, um, kind of in case, well, I'm not sure how familiar people are necessarily with the user namespace. We've done talks similar to that at LSS, I don't know, for America or Europe or online for a few, a few years now. Um, but in case you're not too familiar with the user namespace, just going to do a very quick intro. So uh, the user namespace was first developed by Eric Biderman. It's been effectively fully merged in Linux kernel, either 3.12 or 3.13, kind of depending on what you consider for it to be fully usable. I tend to be in the 3.13 camp. So late 2013, effectively, as far as timeline. So we're getting very close to a decade at this point. Um, the user namespace allows for a process and its descendant to have a UID and GID map in place. And yeah, that effectively allows um, a container that can have something that looks like roots, that can have something that looks like a number of UIDs and GIDs that are actually mapped to something completely different on the host system, uh, getting you to the point where, in theory, root inside of um, that namespace would be about as privileged as a nobody user on the system should they find a way to escape. That's the general idea there. Um, anyone can create them. Um, there's like anyone can just create a new user namespace and anyone can map themselves uh, to any UID or GID they want inside that. So pretty commonly, you will just create a new user namespace and then promptly map yourself as being UID zero and GID zero inside of that namespace. If you want more complex mappings, because a normal user doesn't actually own more than just their own UID and GID, then you need a privileged process to help you with that. Uh, most Linux distros uh, through the Shadow project will ship uh, with a couple of tools called new, new UID map and new GID map, which then read uh, effectively set UID binaries that will read a file inside of ITC, uh, ITC sub UID and ITC sub GID respectively. That then allows delegating effectively a range of UIDs and GIDs to an unprivileged user so that they can directly use that within user namespaces. Also, if you need to configure networking, kind of the same deal. Uh, if you create a new network namespace from inside of a user namespace, well, you get no networking whatsoever, uh, and you can create some network devices there. You can create like a virtual Ethernet pair, you can create a dummy device, but that won't really get you any kind of functional networking. If you want something that's connected to the outside world, you're going to need a privileged process to help you with that. So, um, you know, just for the basics, I'm going to show how to do you get around with just creating a user namespace. So I'm a completely normal user on a normal system, nothing fancy whatsoever. You use the unshare command, which these days pretty much comes by default on most systems. And capital U is I want a new user namespace. And often you're going to want a few more namespaces just to make things more usable. So dash P gets you a bit namespace, dash M gets you a mount namespace. Then you've got dash R, which is the flag that remaps your UID and GID to root one, so UID zero, GID zero inside of the namespace. And lastly, because you're using a PID namespace, you should um, have the command fork for you so that you end up being properly inside of that namespace. You run that, and hey, you root. Um, I mean, yeah, as far as, far as pretty much the, everything is concerned, you are root, uh, but you are root inside of a namespace with a map that just maps your UID and GID over to that root user. So anyone can do that. Um, from that point on, uh, you can, like in this case, I've got my own mount table, so I can start mounting uh, if I wanted as a privileged user to just, I don't know, my, uh, oops, I can't type today, apparently. Yeah, so I can mount a Temperfest now. Uh, I can mount some virtual file stems, I can do that kind of stuff, I can do bind mounts. All of that works and is effectively allowed, well, available to anyone. 
Now, going back to slides. Apparently, I can't switch to the next one. There we go. Um, so, what's kind of the most common setup as far as actually consuming this stuff? Well, other than what I just showed, which is like the single user case where just a single UID is mapped through, most of the time you're going to want 65,536 UIDs and GIDs be mapped. That's simply because POSIX is kind of nice to have. Um, a lot of things are going to get mad at you if they don't get their nobody, no group mapping. So it, most of the time you're going to be mapping that entire range through uh, just to have things be more usable. You also will pretty often want additional namespaces. Most of the time, if you're going to try to run like a normal Linux application, you're going to want the PID namespace, the MAP namespace, UTS, which is primarily for the host name, um, network namespace, potentially C group namespace, and most of the time you also want the IPC namespace. Um, so most container managers effectively just take all of them and bind them all together. Uh, but you can still mix and match depending on what you want, what you want to do. Like we've definitely seen use cases where you may want to share your PIDs with the host, or you may want to share your network with the host, in which case just don't create a new instance of those. Um, you can run with the full host map if you want to. So as I said, uh, in this case, I just had one UID and GID configured, uh, but with a privileged process, you can write whatever you want, including creating a user namespace that effectively has no real map by you writing the host map, so the entire range of possible UIDs and GIDs into the namespace. You can do that, you shouldn't do it. You should never ever map UID, the real UID zero to anything because then you've got the real UID zero, which is a very bad idea, um, but you can. It's, um, the, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that you do, you do get UID zero in there and you do, it does look like you have every single capability, but you need to keep in mind that that's not actually quite true. You effectively have those capabilities against resources that belong to the namespace. Uh, that's why in the kernel you've got both is capable and is NS capable. The NS capable one being what actually checks that stuff. Um, if something is doing a normal is capable check, you're gonna always fail it from inside of a user namespace. And if you want extra security, what you should probably do is actually have non-overlapping maps uh, for every one of your containers, every one of your environments. That's mostly to avoid issues where there might be some kind of resource limits or resource counters that's tied directly to a UID, um, which could then be used from within two um, different containers, and you could effectively DOS the other one. All right, so just back to demo stuff. I'm um, just going to be creating a few containers here real quick. I'm just clicking this box again. Uh, 22.04, you want. Okay. So this is going to be just a basic container as we create them in NextD. So it's going to be using a user namespace, but it's going to be mapping a lot of UIDs and GIDs. So we can see it actually maps, every, it maps, what is it, like a billion UIDs and GIDs starting at uh, 1 million. And same thing for the GIDs. So that's kind of our default. But you can also do security ID map isolated true, which then has LexD look for a chunk of 65,536 UIDs and GIDs by default. So if I go in U2 and I look at proxf UID map, and if I do then the same thing in U3, that shows you that's like safer case where we're effectively um, using different maps for each container. All right. Now let's talk about the file system because that's where things get interesting with containers. So, um, the, in the early days, and that's still the case for, for most people dealing with, with um, user namespace and containers especially, the user namespace maps UIDs and GIDs. Um, the file system writes, well, needs to store also UIDs and GIDs. But what the file system will store is the host value. So effectively the map is applied and then whatever ends up on host is what ends up on the file system. Um, there's an exception to that, which is for virtual file systems. So if you're inside of a user namespace ins and inside of a, na a map namespace that's tied to it, and you mount something like TempFS or Fuse or something like that, then what's sent through the file system is the 
um, the UID and GID as you see it within that namespace instead of the translated version. That's mostly okay. Um, that was a convenient design uh, of the user namespace that meant we didn't need to do anything like external attributes to keep track of UIDs and GIDs all over the place, um, any of that. It just worked on pretty much ev like every file system and everywhere. That was convenient. But there are some issues with that. Um, the most common issues you're gonna get are sharing files with the host. That can be kind of useful. You're running a container, you want to share, I don't know, some directory in your home directory, or you want to share some system files or whatever. Um, it's kind of useful to be able to do that. You technically can. The main problem is that because those files are gonna be owned by UIDs and GIDs that are not resolvable, they're gonna show up as the overflow UID and GID. Uh, so it's gonna all show as uh, 65, 534. Um, that's a bit annoying, also because that UID actually can exist inside of the container, but not be the same. <laughs> like the, the, the effectively the hard-coded overflow UID is a valid UID. Um, and it gets a bit wonky, plus it doesn't let you write uh, in, in most of the cases. Even if you've got full write permissions, it, it doesn't really work. The other case um, that's very important uh, is sharing root file systems with other containers that are either using a different map or that are not using map. And that's because that's what unfortunately most people do. Um, Docker, Kubernetes, all of those those application containers that are based on top of layers, because those layers are effectively used as a shared root file system for a variety of containers. They can't themselves have different UIDs and GID maps. Um, like you, if the layers were themselves already shifted, then it would be fine for one container and it would be showing as the overflow UID for another. So that doesn't actually work. Um, so that's been a bit of a problem. The, the other problem would be if you're running isolated containers, which I normally recommend people do in production, you don't really want to have any kind of overlap for your, for your maps. If you do that and you then want to share, I don't know, the tree of your web server or something like that between multiple of those containers, then it's not gonna work. Um, whoever writes the stuff will be fine and all of the others will sit as the overflow. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, and I can check kind of show the, the way the stuff currently works here. Um, so if I look at, oops, I need this guy here. Is that showing up right? No, that's not right, okay. Um, two, 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 four. So I'm on purpose forcing it onto um, a setup that doesn't have any kind of ID map shifting or that kind of stuff, which this is a bit hard because the kernel actually has some fixes for the issues I'm showing. Um, so that should get us a container soon enough. It's taking actually a bit longer to unpack than expected. Okay, there we go. So we can actually see briefly it showed remapping container. That's because it is unprivileged. It's an unprivileged container with the old school way of doing it. So we took an image that is, um, has the wrong UIDs and GIDs and then promptly had to rewrite all of that stuff the way that actually looks like. So if I go inside of the container, I should see that things oops, look normal. Um, if we look at how it's mounted, we should just see, in this case it's using, um, it's using ZFS, fine, it's mounted, nothing weird. And if we go and look at, so it's actually hidden in the mount namespace, so I just need to go and enter that, okay. And then I go look at the actual file system tree, containers, you want root of us. Yeah, we can see that everything that's actually stored on disk is all shifted. Um, that works in this case for LexD because we are running system containers. They each have their completely own standalone file systems. So we can actually go and rewrite all the UIDs and GIDs on startup, it's fine. If you try to do the same thing with a Docker container, you're gonna, because it's using OverlayFS, it's gonna effectively fork the entire file system, which is not exactly ideal. Um, so not really an option for in, in that scenario. So that's, that's kind of the state of things. Now, what can we do about it? Well, 
our first attempt to do something about this was with something called shiftfs. Um, occasionally, we forget the f, um, the first one. Um, it's, it's been a bit of an issue. Uh, <laughs> and so it's effectively, it was designed uh, by James Bottomley originally, then picked up by, by my team at Canonical. We did a bunch of work to make it function. It is still part of the Ubuntu kernel because unfortunately the nicer way of doing this, which I'll present next, does not yet cover all the file systems we care about. So we still need to keep it around for a little while longer. Um, the way it works is that it's effectively an overlay file system. It's very similar to something like OverlayFS. And pretty much all that it does is it lets you do UID and GID translation across uh, user namespace. It's got a lot of issues. Um, it gets particularly funny with a lot of the kernel caches, VFS cache, or that kind of stuff. We tend to have a lot of things not getting properly invalidated and having some weird behavior where like, we see the wrong content of the file or the wrong permissions or the wrong everything. Um, we've been running into a lot of, of weirdness around that. The other thing that's particularly fun with file systems are ioctals, and when you are running an overlay that reports itself actually as being a different file system name, but then needs to still support the ioctals of another file system, say we were supporting doing burrfs subvolumes, for example, uh, yeah, that's been fun. Yeah. We did manage to mostly make it work in the cases we cared about, but it's, it's a massive headache, and that definitely proved that this was not the right way to do it. Uh, but was still a good exercise. Now, if I switch back to my laptop, here I do have, so that U1 container I created earlier. This one should actually be running on shiftfs. Yeah, so here we can see that the mount is actually listed as shiftfs and there's a pass through equals three, which is the mode we need to get ioctals and that kind of stuff through. Now, if we go look, I'll actually do it as root, uh, mount, run, oops, yeah, mount, run, cd, uh, ns, list, mount, come on, yeah. Okay, um, so if I'm in that mount namespace now and I go look at bus, not list, common, list, containers, u1, rootfs, so shiftfs does do the job in that, unlike the previous tree I showed you, this one is effectively shifted by shiftfs and is so, so is written as the normal, uh, the actual, this, the owner inside the container it matches the owner outside of it as far as the file system is concerned. Not as far as any of the other security bits, like all the processes and everything are still correctly shifted, but the file system is not. And that means that uh, creating those kind of uh, instances is effectively instantaneous because we don't need to go and rewrite the entire tree. Uh, we can also easily share uh, mounts with the, the host, no problem. We can share stuff between two containers. So effectively, all of those issues are effectively solved by this, other than it being a disaster because it's a file system and doesn't actually quite do, quite deal well, well, it doesn't deal well at all with all of the edge cases. All right, so what's the proper way to fix this? Well. We actually have it. Uh, it's VFS ID map shifting or ID mapped mounts in the kernel. Uh, that was done by Christian Branner, who used to be on my team at the time and who was supposed to be presenting alongside me now. And um, that's, yeah, the real solution to this entire problem. It's done a string extra system call and flags all in the kernel within the VFS. There's currently support, and I might have missed a few because they keep adding a bunch, uh, ext4, xfs, vfat, burrfs, f2fs, and overlayfs are the one that I'm aware of as far as supporting this feature. Um, we are working upstream with uh, zfs to get that one sorted. I also need cefs to be sorted. Uh, for cefs, Christian has a big patch that does it, but there's some security concerns, so it's not much yet. Um, this doesn't choose overlays at all. It's all done at the vfs layer. So it does the right thing around ioctals and all of that stuff. There's no weirdness at all. And it actually pushes some of that logic into the file systems that can then decide what is safe and what is not. Uh, so really nice and convenient. That was introduced with 5.12. Uh, at the time, I believe it was ext4 and vfat maybe, with xfs being happening very shortly after. Burrfs, I think, was 5.15. Um, overlayfs is more recent than that. So that's been rolling out slowly. There's still a lot more file systems to go. Uh, there's currently no support for that on any kind of network file system either. So there's a bunch more things that are needed. 
um, I can show you this guy in action. So I'm going to need to switch back to this system instead. And for that one, uh, so if I do Ubuntu 24.42. Ah, it's in the backing again, because this time it's not on ZFS. This time it's doing it on the XT4. Again, because ZFS doesn't actually support this, so <laughs> I need to, to run it on the XT4 instead. So the unpack took a little while. There we go, and now if I go in there, and I look at hot self mount info, and just look at the main mount. So this time we can see that it is reported as ext4, and if you look uh, around the middle, there's uh, in the mount flags, you can see id mapped. Now, similarly to the other, the ownership is perfectly fine inside, and now if I go look, I think I must have this in the history, yep. Um, and I go look at vast map, Lexd Lexd containers, U2 rootfs. So exact same behavior as shiftfs, but no shiftfs inside, effectively. Uh, and no weird bugs and caching issues or any of that kind of weirdness. That's all gone, just very nice and convenient. So that's the new way of doing things. It's great. Now, moving on, different topic, um, new, new namespaces. Um, there's been some discussions over the years of like, oh, we need to add so and so. I think the most recent namespace we've had um, now is the time namespace, but that's been a few years already. And um, but there are a few more coming up, and it was quite interesting to go to uh, Linux Plumbers and kind of summit this week and talking to well, about a few a few things that are that's going on around there. Um, the new pattern for a lot of the new namespaces is not to have them be completely standalone namespaces um, that would normally use their own clone flags uh, and be like, yeah, completely separate. Instead, uh, the, the, the new trend is to have them dangle off the user namespace. So you use the user namespace and then uh, you can enable some specific additional namespaces. That makes things easier. Um, and because technically there's nothing preventing you from having a user namespace that's effectively useless by having the user namespace um, use the entire host map, you can still use that even if you do want to run privileged processes. The first one of those uh, would be the for integrity measurement, so the IMAR namespace. That's been a work that's been ongoing for quite a while now, mostly driven by Stefan Berger at IBM. Uh, there's actually been V14 of this patch set su submitted this morning, so there's definitely actively work there. There's a full talk on it at uh, LSSNA, so the, the one in Aston. Uh, you can probably find a recording for that. And yeah, so it is, the namespace is tied to the user namespace. And what it does is reasonably straightforward too. It allows for the use of IMA inside a container so that you can have um, everything you access effectively be measured and be able to, to run well, an IMA policy against it. The other one we've been discussing um, this week is the tracing namespace. So that was uh, brought up by Mathieu, de Mathieu Desnoyers. And it allows, again, kind of makes sense based on the name, uh, it allows for running tracing tooling inside of containers. So that would then allow uh, tracing any task within the container or within uh, one of the children of that container. That's, that can be pretty useful, it's gonna be interesting. Uh, I think it's one of those namespaces that's going to have to kind of grow over time where like a very, very small subset of things would be allowed at the beginning and then that would grow. Um, because if you think of what you can currently access from something like BPF trace, it's a bit scary. Uh, so it's going to be difficult to make it perfectly safe. Um, but that will at least put the infrastructure in place and then bit by bit uh, more and more can be, can be made available. Uh, and that should be a very useful feature uh, for, for debugging uh, or for simulating different systems. There's also been a separate discussion kind of related to that around restartable sequences and how that all fits with uh, containers and CPU sets specifically. The current way uh, they're trying to get some of the vCPU ID um, feature of, res of uh, restartable um, sequences is to effectively pre-allocate a bunch of, uh, of memory, one per potential CPU ID. The issue is that it's literally per possible one because uh, CPU hot plug is a thing that exists. So you need to look at what's the total number of CPUs you might ever have on the system, which um, 
I think on most x86 systems, going to be 64 or something like that. Uh, depends on distros. Some of them cl uh, clamp it down. Firmware can also set it down, I believe. But that makes that could create um, some issues by having to allocate a lot more memory than you want. So there was a discussion around: can we, like, we'd like this to be kind of tied to the CPU set, and also where do those maps then go? So the current plan, but that was like, at, towards the closing of plumbers, and things will probably change. Uh, would be to tie some of the uh, some of the maps to the IPC namespace because that feature is primarily used for IPC, and then uh, also look at the CPU sets to figure out what's the total number of CPUs that can be accessed, and then use that instead of allocating all of the possible ones. There seems still some difficulties there because it's possible to reconfigure a CPU set C group to have more CPUs, and if you put checkpoint restore in the mix, uh, which is always very fun then it's possible to take those tasks and move them to another system that's got a completely different um, maximum number of CPUs. So there was also some discussions of maybe capturing that inside of CRIU so that if you're live migrating tasks from one system that's got a, um, like a, say a limit of 32 possibles and you move to a system that's got now a limit of 64 possibles, you would effectively have CRIU automatically set up the CPU set on, on the receiver to match the maximum of the source one kind of avoiding that issue. So there's a, still a lot going on around that. It's a pretty interesting topic. It's going to be interesting to see what, what the kind of final solution ends up being. And again, different, different kind of topic. Um, how to restrict the user namespace. So as I said, it's been around for about a decade, um, but there's, there's still a potential attack surface. Um, it still exposes a lot of stuff in the kernel that normally would not have been exposed to unprivileged users. Pretty much all the bugs we can find from that are not bugs of the user namespace, they're pre-existing bugs elsewhere in the kernel that just were not really exposed before. Um, but still, there's often people want to, to restrict that. And it used to be done with a pretty darn big hammer of like, let's just not build a thing in the kernel at all. But that's less and less viable because people like to run containers. They like, like even non-containers, like there's, you know, we've seen web browsers using user namespaces. We've seen a lot of things using, using user namespaces as a very convenient way to, to read, or to actually reduce privileges on specific processes. So just turning it off is not really an option. Now, what can you do today well, today you can, you, you can limit them a tiny bit. Uh, effectively, there's a bunch of view counts that lets you restrict how many namespaces of various types a user can use. That's, okay, sure, you can set that to zero, but then you don't really have anything anymore. Um, you don't really get to control per user, you don't get to control um, per process or anything. Your other option there would be to use second to force a tree to not be able to use the user namespace by effectively doing flag filtering on things like clone and unshare. The problem is that clone three is a thing that exists uh, and we cannot filter it because it's using a struct as a pointer and so second can filter that. You can block it off entirely, um, at which point you just rely on clone two and that one is filterable. The problem is that eventually there's gonna be a bunch of more useful flags in clone three that people will actually want and we won't be able to just block it. Uh, the other option there is that a bunch of distros have uh, custom patches to add syscatals that either lets you on the fly turn off the entire user namespace or turn off its use by unprivileged users. So that's kind of the state of things. Uh, I can just show you what the what that looks like as far as the the flags. So if you look at Proxy's user today, uh, you've got those max underscore whatever namespaces. If you change, if you set one of those to zero, then nobody can unshare that namespace anymore. That's, but that's about the extent of the flexibility around that. So um, there's been some discussion to add a new LSM hook that would actually take care of that issue by allowing uh, LSMs to make the decision as to whether a new user namespace can be created or not. Uh, patch sets came from Cloudflare, I believe, Frederick Lola or something like that. Um, that seems like an approach that the security community and a lot of people think makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the maintainer, Eric Bederman, does not think it makes sense and it doesn't really want to see any way to, 
to restrict user namespaces. Um, so there's still more, kind of more discussions to, to happen there and see how that can be done. Um, maybe it would be, um, maybe there's a way to convince Eric to, to actually want this and make it go through. Um, or potentially, I don't know, getting something maybe more generic, which is not just user namespace, but is about more around um, the clone flags and being able to say, you know, have an LSM hook there, looking at the clone flags and then being able to allow or reject the, the clone operation or the unshare operation based on that. So that's still uh, ongoing, hoping to see that unblocked because it would make it a lot easier for people. I don't like the big hammer of let's just turn it off entirely. Uh, I'd much prefer having this true or system policy that can um, allow just like trusted processes or whatever to, to then be able to, to use the user namespace. All right, again, different topics still related to user namespaces. Uh, system call interception. So, I mean, our, our goal has been now for years uh, to completely kill off the concept of a privileged container. So privileged container, for anyone not aware, is a container where real root, well, there's no ID map in place, real root in the container is real root outside of it. Yes, you can try and drop capabilities and put LSMs in place and all that kind of stuff to try and paper over all of the issues, but at the end of the day, you still have a bit of an issue if anything runs as real root in the container. Chances are they'll find a way to get out, and if they get out, they're full real root, which is never a good day. Um, so we want to get rid of that. Uh, the problem with unprivileged containers using the user namespace is that, well, you have about as much privileged as a nobody user. That's a good thing for security, but that's not necessarily a good thing. Well, it depends on your workloads. Um, that's, that can break a lot of stuff. System code interception lets us get around that um, because we can intercept specific system calls, send that to a privileged process outside of the container, and then that privileged process can do whatever checks it feels like and then perform the action on the caller's behalf, deciding, like, uh, getting just the permissions just right to take the extra permissions needed to do the action but nothing else, and then um, effectively replicating as many of the uh, permissions and setup of the caller as you possibly can. That lets us do things like load and attach BPF programs after validation, uh, mounting file systems, setting advanced scheduler flags, loading kernel modules, a lot of really things that people tend to think we're kind of crazy for doing, but if we do the right kind of checks around, we can actually make it reasonable. So there's kind of two different things around that I, that I usually consider around system code interception. One thing is dealing with trusted resources. So in this case, um, it's effectively yeah, it's a system call that normally would not succeed, but we know that what it's running against is actually perfectly safe. So even if we don't really trust the caller, we trust that the thing it's trying to access is safe and therefore we allow it. Um, this includes uh, things like mounting some network or virtual file systems. Uh, it also includes actually mounting full-on blocks, uh, which is usually terrifying because you don't want an untrusted chunk of random block device to be thrown at the superblock parser and see what happens. Um, but if we know that the block device has never been exposed to an untrusted user or process, so they never had the opportunity to write to it, and the host itself is the one who allocated that block device and formatted it, then it's actually fine. Um, so we, we may allow mounting in that case. Um, same thing for BPF uh, program. It's also a very bad idea in many cases. But if we know exactly what program it is, we can validate that it looks like what it should be, and it's attaching to a specific point that we know is fine, we can allow it. The current thing we're doing for that is the, C, the devices C group under C group V2 is now BPF based. And um, well, we wanted that to work, so we've done the work to have a flag instead of LexD that allows specifically BPF for devices C group uh, to be attached through. It's um, also uh, that's something that we still need to do, but I also want to allow loading kernel modules, and that one is extremely scary for obvious reasons. But uh, the, the plan effectively is we'd like someone to be able to load some specific, um, say, NetFilter extensions. Uh, not any of them, but specific ones that we know are fine. And the idea there is that they would do the normal mod probe 
that then calls init module. We would uh, look at what they're passing, figure out what the module is. We would absolutely not load it from there because that would be an extremely bad idea. Um, but we would then, after we've checked it against the allow, allow list, um, go and load the host, value, the host version of that particular module. So the caller gets the result they want. They have now the proc files or netting API or whatever that they wanted, but we never trusted the module they actually provided. We just checked that it's a, it's a module that we generally allow for dynamic loading. That saves us from having to preload a lot of modules that may or may not be used on the system. Um, so that's something where we're going to be looking at doing that. The other aspect of it would be trusted workloads. Um, so that's things like, yeah, we want to use user namespaces because we don't want, really want to use anything else, but then um, it's a trusted workload running in there that needs quite a bit of extra permissions. Say you're building a full OS image using the bootstrap, using uh, like then creating an actual uh, loop mount, like a loop device that you then mount and everything. That's the other case where like we literally, we know that this particular workload, we trust it. Um, we don't want to make it fully privileged necessarily because there's no real good reason for that. They only need a tiny bit more uh, privileges. So we can do it that way. The permission we'd, we'd be giving could potentially be used to attack the system. So that's definitely needs trust in the workload, but that's the other thing we can do. Uh, and that still saves us from running a fully privileged container. All right, um, so in conclusion, well, the introduction of the, the, the VFS ID map, so the ID map to mount feature, uh, I really see as being a game changer because for containers and user namespace adoption, the big, big elephant in the room for years now has been Docker Kubernetes. Um, like that's, that represents the vast majority of containers out there and they are just not safe. Um, like the fact that they effectively run privileged and the main, like they, they rely heavily on SecComp and Apana, or they rely on just uh, switching user and never running something as root, which that part is actually fine. Um, the problem is that a lot of cases they don't do that. It's, it's kind of terrifying. Uh, I'm really glad that we've got, with this, we've got a solution that can be used for the kind of layered uh, file systems that they are using to still ship all of their layers unshifted and then be able on a per container basis to decide, okay, well, this thing is gonna be unprivileged. Therefore, I'm gonna be using VFS ID map on top of that overlay file system. And now you get to run with a user namespace in place. And all of the work we've been doing uh, over the years now, both enabling the second data fire uh, and then the, the user space side of in implementing software to actually process the notifications and increase permissions, means that even the few, the few images or cases they may have that would not uh, work very well instead of a user namespace, a lot of those are effectively solved problems that we can safely check and safely allow. Um, so I'm really hoping that now, I mean, it's gonna take a few years for that feature to be available widely. As I said, like the, the overlay FS uh, bit, I think was probably merged in the last kernel release or something. Um, so it's gonna take a few years for that to hit LTS in different distros and people to actively use that. But we've, we've got like a good path forward there and I'm hoping that, I don't know, probably given another decade, nobody will use previous containers anymore, maybe. Um, that would definitely be great and we'd definitely like to see, to see that adoption, um, really, like especially for yeah, Docker Kubernetes. Um, it's also very exciting to see new user name, uh, new namespaces being added. The the work on IMA is very interesting. Like it's 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 going to be interesting being able to actually test something like IMA without having to test it in like a full virtual machine on your on your, or on your entire system by being able to do it on a per container basis. That's that's really really interesting. Um, kind of same thing goes for tracing. That just makes it possible to have containers that feel even more like a virtual machine, like even more like a standalone. Linux system, um, so also quite looking forward uh, forward to that work. I think it's a good pattern that we have now that effectively all of the new namespaces end up dangling off of the user namespace. That really simplifies the review, it simplifies in the infrastructure inside of the, the Linux kernel, um, and yeah, should allow for for more namespacing of um, well, different parts of the Linux kernel as we as we see them. Uh, second interception is also a great, great workaround uh, for a lot of cases that 
normally if we were just like, well, you're running as an unprivileged user, unprivileged users just don't get to do that. Um, and the only way we had before to deal with that was patching user space to not do it, um, which is not great. Or say, okay, well, this thing absolutely needs a virtual machine or a previous container. Now we've got another solution. Uh, it works pretty well. It is tricky. Um, like it, it's, it's not very pleasant having to do all of that stuff. The, the privileged process that runs on the host that needs to actually perform the action, that's extremely security sensitive. Um, so, so there's still issues there, um, but there's at least a workaround we can use uh, and that's been working pretty well for us. And yeah, I mean, my and in conclusion, like I'm hoping that given a few years, maybe a decade, we'll finally have privileged containers be a thing of the past. Um, that will rely on, well, have containers that are safer in general. And yeah, just a, well, more namespaces, more features, containers feeling a lot more like individual systems. And that's it for me. Uh, I believe we've got about four minutes for questions. Um, if nobody has questions, we can do an early lunch, but any questions? Looks like people are hungry. Thank you. Uh, did we get any online question maybe? Uh, nope, okay. Well, I think that's gonna be an early wrap then. Thank you very much. <laughs>